All right, we can go ahead and get started. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for joining this afternoon's webinar on the European Green Crab. My name is Maria Marlin and I'm the Community Outreach and Environmental Education Specialist for the Washington Invasive Species Council. And first I want to just go through some housekeeping rules before we get started. The webinars are being, oops, are being recorded. And after each webinar, the recordings will be available on our website. Now, if you have a question for the speaker, please put them in the Q&A option in Zoom. It's gonna be on your Zoom toolbar. And we're going to have a Q&A session at the end. So all questions will be held to the end, but please drop them in there as they come up. And only use the chat for technical difficulties or questions if you um, are having problems connecting to the webinar or hearing. We are gonna have a poll during the webinar and we're gonna present a code word at some point. Now, these are both really important that you um, pay attention and participate in the poll if you are seeking pesticide recertification credit. And finally, if you lose connection to the webinar, uh, you just are going to use the same link to rejoin. And the invitation also has a phone number that you can call in if you are unable to join on the web. And with that, I am pleased to introduce Justin Bush, the Executive Coordinator of the Council, and he's going to provide an introduction and overview of Invasive Species Awareness Week. Great. Well, thank you, Maria. Um, this is a very special week. Governor Jay Inslee proclaimed this week as Invasive Species Awareness Week in solidarity with a national event. So all around the United States, there are events and webinars happening to raise awareness of invasive species and to emphasize simple actions that we all can take in our daily lives to prevent and stop invasive species. Putting some dollar figures on this over the last 50 years, the cost for our nation in terms of uh, management of invasive species, of prevention, as well as damages to our economy and our environment, total over $1.2 trillion. Invasive species are highly impactful and they can damage and harm every aspect of our lives. And a lot of the invasive species that are the worst in the United States are not yet widely established in Washington. So we have this really great opportunity to raise awareness of invasive species and place emphasis on simple actions we can all do to be part of the solution. And so um, really thank you all for being here today and thank our colleagues from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife for joining us. And we'd like to welcome everyone to Invasive Species Awareness Week and thank you for your time. Great, thank you, Justin. All right, I am now pleased to introduce Alan Klaus from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Alan, if you'd like to unmute and introduce yourself and provide a welcome. Yes, thank you. My name is Alan Ploys. I'm with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. I'm the Aquatic Invasive Species Unit Manager and the Incident Commander for the European Green Crab Emergency Response. Um, just going to give you a quick overview. We've uh, ramped up a lot in the last year, um, and we that pretty much started with Governor Inslee's issuing a emergency proclamation back in January of 22. The legislature quickly followed with uh, allocating the department approximately 8.5 million dollars for that for that year uh, two year combination in emergency measures funding, of which approximately 6 million is ongoing uh, annually. The, uh, with that funding, the department set up an incident command structure, and that really provides a really good command control, communication and coordination uh, structure for uh, this type of event, which is statewide in all marine waters. We also wanna commend uh, all the people for the quick planning, logistics and operations ramp up and capture of significant numbers of green crabs statewide in 2022. That was a lot of, um, of initiative by multiple partners to, to be able to be, make that happen. So there's also uh, extensive policy and technical collaboration with our tribal co-managers and partner organizations. 
happy to say that there were no major health and safety issues that occurred uh, from all the activities that happened statewide. Um, we're also working very hard to be transparent in our public communications and outreach efforts. One of uh, another uh, accomplishment in 22 was we completed a, uh, an emergency measures strategic action plan. And um, we're also continuing to trap green crab over the winter months. Um, it's at a reduced level and it's mostly boat based, but um, and it's when we say we, it's always a very large collaborative effort out there. So again, this incident has multiple jurisdictions, state, tribal, federal, local government, private. There's different management priorities, management types. Some are doing early detection. Some of them are doing rapid response. Some are doing control work, operational complexities. It's different when you're doing from shore based to boat based. Um, all sorts of different weathers, uh, resource capacities. Again, we've been ramping up quite a bit to increase those capacities, both within the department to be able to uh, support others' efforts, as well as supporting them in creating, in uh, putting together their own resources. We're also looking at, you know, what are the priorities for protection out there, sensitive habitat, um, private landowners, their uh, shellfish aquaculture, cultural sites, things like that. So there's a lot of partners out there, a lot of uh, support. So that's really the, the sort of the background of 2022. In 23, we are working forward to uh, taking what we've learned and going to apply it to this year. And that's uh, going to be, a, a, it's still going to take some time to uh, collect all that information and work with our uh, the local entities, such out at Willapa Bay or Grace Harbor or up in the North Puget Sound. There's a lot of different areas we're going to work, and each one of those has its own operations. Um, you'll hear today from uh, Brian Turner, who's uh, working on establishing a scientific task force. We're also completing a quarterly report to the legislature. Um, we provide situation reports uh, every operation period, which is about every two weeks. And we're also working on online data collection and such. So a lot going on and you'll hear about a lot of that today and I'll be around for questions afterwards. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alan. All right, I am now going to introduce Chase Grinnell from the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And he's going to just provide a quick overview of the webinar today. Chase? Yeah, uh, Alan really queued it up well. Um, I'm just going to continue with some of the introduction that he started. We're also going to play a short video from one of our local public affairs TV stations that ran this past August covering European green crab in Washington. Then you're going to hear uh, a lot more detail from Dr. Brian Turner about European green crab biology field efforts and trapping that's been underway in Washington, some of the emerging science around this invasive species. And then finally, we'll hear from Jessica Osfeld, who's our WDFW European green crab outreach specialist about how the public can get involved, how you can help through identification of European green crab and public reporting. And then we'll have a little bit of Q&A at the end with um, particularly Dr. Turner and Alan Ployce, again, our WDFW incident commander for the state's emergency response. So before we get to those experts, um, we're just going to start out with this quick video from one of our, um, from KPTC Public Television that helps provide an overview and some shots from the field. Great. Western Washington has over 3,000 miles of coastline, from the outer Pacific coast to the interior Puget Sound, offering an abundance of not only beauty, but also life. But along with concerns over climate change and pollution comes another threat, the invasion of the European green crab. This invasive species could do damage from our outer coasts through the Salish Sea and into Puget Sound damaging and even potentially destroying our local ecosystem. 
With invasive species, once it becomes a disaster, it's too late. Alan Ployce is the Aquatic Invasive Species Unit Manager for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And European green crab are one of those very bad actors that when they find a new area, they reproduce and they do harm. Just last January, Governor Jay Inslee issued an emergency order after thousands of European green crabs were found in the Lemmy Nation Sea Pond and on the outer coast. This infestation has gotten so bad that we're beyond the point of being able to fully eradicate this species. Instead, efforts are underway to keep their population under control. So our effort is to keep them under control, and control means below a threshold where they are less or not a harm to our environment, to the economy, or to cultural resources in the state. What that number is, we don't know. DFW is not alone in this fight. Local tribes have gotten involved and partnered with Fish and Wildlife to fight the European green crab invasion, including the Lummi and Macaw tribes. This infestation is strongest in the Lemmy Nation Sea Pond near Bellingham, where last year more than 70,000 green crabs were found. There's also major infestations on the outer coast, including Nia Bay, Grays Harbor, and Willapa Bay. But in recent months, the European green crab has also been found in the Hood Canal near Seabeck. And so we are working with our tribal co-managers. They are a critical uh, partner in this, co-manager of this resource. And um, we're also working with the shellfish growers. We're working with whoever wants to help us in this endeavor. Taylor Shellfish is one of our area's top producers of locally sourced seafood. The company has also been heavily involved in advocacy for clean water. And they've joined this fight as this invasion poses a huge threat to their shellfish farms located throughout our region. Yeah, I think for now it's really more the, uh, the unknown and the threat. Bill Dewey is the spokesman for Taylor Shellfish and he's also a shellfish grower. He says that so far trapping efforts appear to be paying off. And, and it's, you know, hopefully paying dividends. We had a couple uh, years where we caught about 100 each, and then this summer the trapping's been slow. I think we've only caught about 18 crabs so far after two months of trapping this year. This is a very simple area uh, okay. to trap, right, yeah. but imagine like channels everywhere. And you have Chelsea Buffington is a biologist for the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife working on the Green Crab Project. The, the number one um, thing to look for for European green crab to identify them are these five spines. Buffington has been trapping European green crabs on the outer Washington coast from Willapa Bay to this location in Grays Harbor near Westport where there's a strong infestation. Willapa and Grays Harbor have uh, pretty high populations. Uh, you know, typically any trap that we set, we see green crab in them. They ripped the heads off. They chopped up this uh, sculpin. Uh, green crab are ecosystem engineers. That's what a lot of people, the buzzword lately is an ecosystem engineer. Uh, you know, they outcompete with our native species. They are predators. They have um, very big appetites. They kind of eat anything that they can get their hands on. Given the size of the Washington coastline and multiple concerns over using chemical agents to control European green crabs, trapping has become the biggest and best weapon so far in this fight. These areas like behind me, it's just vast. There, you know, we can't set a trap every nook and cranny and there's not a lot of other options in terms of removal. And while trapping and containing these small crabs is no small task, those involved in this collaborative effort say that this isn't only a worthy fight, it's also a huge opportunity to control European green crabs before they can deal a devastating blow to Washington's fragile ecosystem. Most people say, well, if they're going to be here forever, why, why even try? And um, unfortunately, in the invasive species field, that's, that's a common refrain. And our job has been, and we've been successful, to be able to say, we need to try, we need to do it, especially when we have such an incredible opportunity at the front end of an invasion of a very bad species that we can do something. Thank you, Maria. Um, 
I hope that was a helpful overview for everyone. While Maria is getting our presentation back up, I'm gonna just continue the introduction. Um, again, my name is Chase Gunnell. I am my day job with Department of Fish and Wildlife is as our Puget Sound Region Communications Manager. And I'm assigned to support our Aquatic Invasive Species Unit with the European Green Crab Emergency, including as the state's public information officer. And again, you're gonna hear more from Dr. Brian Turner on European green crab science and control and biology in just a minute, as well as from Jessica Osfeld about some of the European green crab community outreach and public engagement that we're really ramping up in the coming year. Um, but before we do that, I'm just gonna talk just a bit more about some of the emergency measures that were deployed in 2022, some of the communications and reporting that we've established, including through the incident command system and um, then I'll turn it over to Brian and Jessica. Okay, uh, Chase, did you want me to share the slides or did you have a copy of them? I'm happy to do it if you would like. If you could go ahead, that would be great. Yes. Thank you so much. Sure. And I think you can That's go right the next slide. Next slide. Oops. Yeah, and so again, oh, um, Again, we'll hear a little bit more about green crabs in just a moment, but really just want to kick it off by underscoring that European green crabs are one of the worst invasive species. They have um, infestations at the number of sites around the globe from Australia to the Eastern Mediterranean to the US East Coast and now to the Pacific Coast of North America. And Washington is really still at the emerging edge of this infestation. These crabs have been established on the West Coast since the 1980s. And it's really only since around 2018 that we've seen a significant increase in European green crabs at specific sites in Washington waters. Uh, Maria, could you go to the next slide? And this is a little bit about what we've done in response as we've seen significant numbers of European green crabs be detected at places on the Washington coast, most notably Willapop Bay, Grays Harbor and Macaw Bay and then also in the North Puget Sound region, particularly in the area around Lummi Bay and the Lummi Nation Sea Pond. Um, as we've detected those increases, again, really ramping up around 2018, potentially linked to warmer water conditions. In 2021, it was determined that the current resources and effort that were being deployed through funding from the Washington State Legislature by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Native American tribes, and partner organizations like Washington Sea Grant were insufficient for control of the emerging threat from European green crabs and some of those larger populations that we were seeing. And so beginning in late 2021 and then continuing in early 2022, um, the, Euro the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, along with a number of the tribal nations, put out requests for additional support, including emergency measures. And in early 2022, an emergency order was declared by Governor Jay Inslee, and I'll share a bit more about that in just a moment, as well as emergency funding that was requested from the Washington State Legislature. And Alan mentioned that in his intro. And thanks to that emergency order and the emergency funding, that 8.6 million that Alan mentioned, some of which is going to Department of Fish and Wildlife and some of which is being passed on to co-manager tribes, local partner groups, uh, being dispersed as grants to aquaculture businesses. We're using that funding to really ramp up the control efforts, the, the literal boots in the mud, traps, equipment, and personnel that are being deployed, as well as to increase coordination. And one of the pieces of that increased coordination was this ICS or incident command system that was established last spring to increase coordination between various state agencies like Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Natural Resources and Washington State Parks, as well as federal partners, Native American tribes, and a whole host of other entities with a stake in protecting Washington's environmental and economic resources against this threatening invasive species. And a big piece of that is, is where I come in and my work with Jessica Osfeld, who's our European Green Group Outreach Specialist, which is through the communications and public engagement to help boost awareness about European green crabs and the threat that they, they face or that, that they bring to our coastal ecosystems and our native shellfish and crab species, as well as some of the, the things that the public can do to help support these emergency measures, including through reporting. 
And so we did establish with Washington Invasive Species Council a new online reporting form and, and launched that last spring. We created some stickers and signs and other outreach materials that we've been steadily working to post at marinas and boat launches, beach access and parks all around Western Washington and really beginning to, to get out the information to build a foundation of public awareness about this species and the emergency measures that were being undertaken to control them. So Maria, if you could go to the next slide, please. And again, this is the emergency proclamation from January 2022 that gave us direction to um, affect the necessary measures to control or prevent the permanent establishment of European green crab, really are focusing on the control elements of this. And Brian, I'll talk about that a bit further. And again, wanna underscore that the emergency order also emphasized the need for increased coordination. And that's been a key part of the incident command system. If you could go to the next slide, please. And this is that ICS system that I mentioned that Alan mentioned in his welcome. Um, Incident command systems are used all across the country. It's a standard model developed by FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Administration, and it helps provide a clear structure and command chain of command for coordinating emergency measures in response to a wide variety of incidents from wildfires to floods and to slow removing emergencies like the one we're facing with European green crab here in Washington, where there's a clear threat to our environmental and economic resources, and we need a coordinated front to respond to that threat, including in different management branches, both on the Washington coast and in the, the Puget Sound or Salish Sea region. And one of the things that this ICS does is establishes a common language. It sets up chains of command and areas for our federal allies to engage, as well as for the co-manager Native American tribes to engage and as well as to lead efforts to control or remove European green crabs on their lands with support from the state and the rest of the ICS system. And it gives us a, a clear framework to move forward as we combat this slow moving emergency. And one of the things that we did produce through this, this incident command system in 2022 was the strategic action plan that Alan mentioned and that we'll talk a little bit more later on in today's webinar. Go ahead to the next slide, please. These are some of the emergency response goals. And um, you know, I want to put up front, as Alan mentioned earlier, the health and safety of all participants is paramount with any incident command. And we're thankful not to have any serious safety incidents in the last year. Anyone who's spent uh, a lot of time out in our coastal estuaries and in the mud and the muck and in small boats knows that these are risky endeavors. And it's very important to prioritize health and safety. And all of our crews um, receive the proper support and training to make sure that they can continue to conduct this emergency response in a safe way. So that's something that we definitely prioritize at the Department of Fish and Wildlife and for all of our partners in this emergency response. Um, go ahead and go on to the next slide, please. Uh, now moving forward into the summer of 2022 and then the fall of this past year and the, the winter that we're now in as we think forward to the next field season um, with the ICS established and some of our initial communications and reporting resources out in the field. The field efforts continued and Brian will talk more about that in a moment. We really focused on recruiting widespread media attention. There was a whole lot of articles in the spring and, and especially into the summer about European green crab in Washington. And the intent there was to, again, really set a foundation of public awareness. This is a um, it may not be new for some of the folks out on the coast who've been seeing green crab for several years now, but the level of emergency was new, the level of attention, um, the level of crabs being caught, and we really wanted to help support public awareness about this threat through widespread media coverage. And so um, I want to just say thank you to all of the reporters and editors that helped prioritize this story over the past year. That media attention was, was very helpful for those of us that are natural resource practitioners trying to get people um, paying attention to this issue and realizing how much of a threat these invasive crabs are. We also worked with the Washington Invasive Species Council and the Recreation and Conservation Office, among other partners, to continue funding of grants to local entities that wanted to engage on European green crab removal. And um, I think there'll be a little bit more about that later in the webinar. And we also really ramped up outreach and public engagement um, my colleague Jessica has been scheduling a number of events for this spring and summer. We've 
gone to several in just the past few months and really talked to hundreds of people, both um, everything from shellfish growers and marina owners to everyday citizens who might be out roaming the beaches or trapping off piers or docks in shallow areas and may encounter European green crabs. And this public outreach is a vital part of our emergency response to really help educate people on how to identify these crabs and then also inform them on what they can do to support emergency measures through reporting. Go ahead on to the next slide, please. This is just a snapshot of some of the recent media coverage. We, again, have been really impressed with the attention and media coverage on this issue over the past um, eight months or so, and it really helps provide a foundation of awareness for what this invasive species is, why we're concerned about them, and what the state, tribes, and a number of others are doing to control them. Go ahead to the next slide. I mentioned some of our new communications and outreach materials, and Jessica is going to talk quite a bit more about this. But I do want to note that if you are aware of a place, whether it's a, a beach that you like to visit or a marina where you keep your boat, that may be a site that is at risk of invasive European green crabs, we do have materials we'd love to get out to help support awareness among your community, to help inform people about how to identify these crabs and then also give them some resources for what they can do if they see them. So please feel free to reach out to Jessica or I if you have questions about getting European green crab materials out in your coastal community. And then also if you are a member of the media and have questions about this topic or interest in tagging along with one of our field crews during the spring and summer field season, I'd be happy to help arrange that. So please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, Maria, go to the next slide, please. So, with that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to the real experts, Dr. Brian Turner, and then Jessica Ospeld, our European Green Crab Outreach Specialist. Thank you. All right, thank you, Chase. Um, I'm assuming we wanna wait till the Q&A section to, to address questions, or do we wanna address yeah. any? Okay, so uh, I will I will we'll do our best when we get to that section. So my apologies for those who have, I appreciate those who've posted questions already. So, um, so again, my name is Brian Turner. I'm with I'm the research scientist with the uh, Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife's Aquatic Invasive Species Unit. So I work with every aquatic invasive species that we cover. But um, today, and for the most part, since I've been hired on, I've been working with European green crab. So, oh yeah, sorry, I forgot this is not mine. Maria, can you go to the next slide, please? So we've talked a little bit about green crabs, um, but I think it's important to kind of think about them in context and to keep it real simple. The European green crab is a small crab. So we tend to think, I think in the Pacific Northwest about Dungeness and red rocks, which in the big grand scheme of things are pretty big crabs. Um, European green crabs don't get much bigger than like four inches wide. And in fact, the majority of them are smaller than that. So your classic sort of crab pots that you're using to catch Dungeness and red rock usually will not capture green crabs. Additionally, these are uh, more shoreline species, so closer inland. Um, and so you're not as likely to, they're not really in the same area as Red Rock and Dungeness. The Red Rocks will eat them. And so those sort of trapping techniques won't catch them very often. Um, they are also fairly aggressive. Now, I don't mean aggressive in that they see you, they'll attack you. I've been pinched by green crabs dozens of times, but to be fair, I'm picking them up and they don't like that. Um, but they're more aggressive in terms of they're very voracious predators. They will eat anything smaller than themselves. And so that includes a lot of different clams, uh, juveniles of uh, larger crab species, other smaller crab species. Uh, I've seen them grab fish that are swimming by. Um, they will eat algae and things as well, uh, but they are uh, very aggressive in terms of their impacts. Um, as was alluded to in one of the questions, they also have um, impacts on eelgrass beds um, and uh, through burrowing. And so there's a lot of sort of impacts they have. They're also very proficient invaders. This is partially due to the fact that they're very tolerant of a wide range of conditions. So they can tolerate pretty freshwater conditions. Uh, they, they can't really do well in pure freshwater, but they can survive lower salinities than a lot of crab species. They also have a wide tolerance for temperature, so they can survive in colder and warmer temperatures. And they also reproduce very quickly. Uh, as you can might be able to see here under proficient invasion, there's this one crab that looks like it has sort of a large berry underneath it that is an egg mass. And green crabs, it, it varies, but they can lay around 180,000 eggs every time they do this. Um, to be fair, most of them will die off, but that's still a lot of output. And so it's easy for them to create relatively large populations fairly quickly. Uh, can you on, go on to the next slide? 
So we've touched on some of this before um, already, but I wanna talk very briefly about the history of green crabs in Washington. So the first detection occurred in 1998 in Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor. Um, I should mention their first detection on the East Coast, or sorry, the West Coast was down in San Francisco in, the, in uh, around 1989. Most likely they were there a little bit before. We have something called an invasion lag when something shows up, uh, we usually don't find it right away. So there's a little bit of a time lag. Um, and then for a long time, green crab numbers were not particularly abundant. Uh, the next big spread for them in uh, the region was up into Sook Basin in 2012. So this was on the British Columbia side of the Salish, but it's not, um, it was still a concern to us because we know that they're spreading. Uh, as a response to this, Fish and Wildlife ended up designated Washington Sea Grant to lead early detection monitoring. monitoring. That's to say, Washington Sea Grant went out to various places where they thought it was likely to catch green crabs um, or it was good habitat for them. And they had set up traps to see if they were present in those areas. And they started sampling in 2015. In 2016, we got our very first um, Salish Sea detection in San Juan. Uh, in 2017, we had a detection in Macaw Bay and Dungeness Spit. In 2018, we started to see increasing numbers in the Salish Sea and in, co in our numbers in our coastal green crab detections. So in response to these increased um, catches, in 2020, the legislature approved a $783,000 proviso to help support our trapping efforts. As Chase alluded to, it was determined that the actions we were capable of at that time, and by we, I mean Fish and Wildlife, as well as our, our partners and co-managers, uh, couldn't handle it with what we had. Um, a good chunk of that funds went on to the Lummi Nation and the Macaw Tribe and to Washington Sea Grant to continue their work. In 2021, the legislature approved a further funding um, again, with much of that funding going to the Lummi Nation and other organizations. Um, and in 2022, as was talked about already, uh, Governor Inslee signed the Emergency pro pro uh, Proclamation for European Green Crab. All right, can we go on to the next slide? Oh, yeah, sorry, I forgot this was here. So you can go on back, actually. So to give you some context of the numbers we're talking about, and the reason why, even when they arrived in 1998, there wasn't suddenly a panic to to go all out is in 1998, the numbers were relatively low. We caught about 300 crabs that year and the numbers were only going down. There wasn't a ton of effort. There wasn't a lot of funding or support to continue doing large efforts. And so there was continued monitoring going on. We were trapping and finding things, but again, the, the numbers weren't really there to support large scale action. But as numbers started to go up, and you can see as of 2021, we caught uh, over 103,000. These are numbers statewide, I should say. Um, uh, green crabs, this is a remarkably different situation than we found ourselves even three years ago. So, all right, go ahead, uh, Maria. I should mention too that when we think about green crab invasion in Washington, we don't think of it as a, a universal or blanket situation. The reality is it, it actually can be thought of as two different invasions occurring based on the circumstances we see. So on the coast, we have relatively higher abundances of green crabs. Uh, their populations are a bit more widespread and continuous along the coast. They've been there a longer period of time and their exposure to larval input is higher. To, to be clear, Green crabs, uh, when their eggs hatched, they they are uh, born as little larval form, and they float in the ocean and are carried around by currents. And so, in that stage, they are uh, it's much easier for them to be transported up the coastline into new locations. Um, so, um, on the out on the coast, they're being exposed to larvae that can be coming up from California and Oregon, um, as well as even south from uh, up in British Columbia. And so, the the point being that. Um, it's a much larger uh, potential for larvae to be introduced there. In the inland areas, they are in much lower populations, generally speaking. These populations are also much sparser and more isolated, restricted to a specific location. As was mentioned, we really only detected them in there in 2016 in Washington, and their exposure to larval input is much lower because they're in the sort of inland way, uh, position, and the currents make it such so it's more difficult for larvae from the coast to come in. That's not to say they can't be um, seeded by larvae from within the Salish Sea um, and that they don't get some input, but it's a significantly less than out on the coast. Can you go ahead and do one more slide? It'll show the second half of that. Uh, oh, didn't do it. Okay. Um, so, 
to be clear, because of this complexity and this issue that we're dealing with, it doesn't make sense to treat all of Washington as one specific location. And so we actually have the state split into two management branches. One is coastal and one is Salish Sea. It's a a little difficult to see because the slide animations made it a little complicated. But basically, if you look at this map from the north coast south, um, that is considered our coastal region. And from the Strait of Juan de Fuca inland, that is our Salish Sea branch. Within those branches, we have further split uh, the state into 13 management areas. These are based on uh, marine fishing areas. And, and it's partially because the conditions are going to be more similar within these spaces and partially just for it's easier to sort of assign resources and time and think about these in smaller sections rather than as a whole. And so that's kind of how we've split it up. Eve, oh. Now, even then, it's not that simple, right? So Washington has over 3,000 miles of shoreline. So this is not, you know, a small task we're talking about. And this is not all um, one jurisdiction, right? So we're talking about lots of different people who are involved, lots of different interests, and lots of different um, jurisdictional areas. So some locations within the state are controlled by different tribal or tribal entities. Some are controlled by federal agencies, some are controlled by the state. Uh, within those locations, we have different um, um, individuals and organizations that have a strong interest in what's going on, but each one having their own priorities and concerns. And a lot of them also have different capacities for taking action. So there might be some organizations that have a lot of people available who are already knowledgeable and able to go out. And then there might be some that are very limited in terms of individuals who are trained to go out in the field, uh, have the proper equipment, um, you know, have the experience and knowledge of the area. And so it's very, it's not a simple task to say, let's go, let everybody go and we'll catch all the green crabs because we want to make sure that we are doing the most effective action while following the regulations and jurisdictions that exist while also protecting um, habitat and species that are already there. And so I wanna just take a moment here um, to highlight the fact that this is, Alan Place mentioned earlier that this is not an or, uh, Washington Fish and Wildlife only act. Um, there are tons of stakeholders involved, tons of individuals and organizations that are involved. Um, this is nothing that Washington Fish and Wildlife could ever do on our own. And because we are um, the state uh, managers of this particular issue, it's easy for it to seem like we're the face of it. But the reality is it's tons of organizations and tons of individuals being involved. And so um, this is our list of co-managers and partners who are heavily engaged, heavily involved, and really allow us to have any sort of impact whatsoever. This would not be possible without all their contributions. And so I want to take a moment to talk about some of these different organizations. And I'll start with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife and why exactly are we involved. Um, I should say that green crab or Carcinus manus is a Washington prohibited level one species. That means it's a species classified as prohibited level one that poses a high invasive risk in our priority for prevention and rapid response management actions. That is to say, these are a species that by state law, we are, we are uh, ordered to manage and deal with within uh, state jurisdictional areas. And so because of that, we are covering, are, are responsible for a very large portion of the state. As I mentioned, though, this is not an isolated fish and wildlife issue. So um, we have many uh, other uh, jurisdictional organizations that are involved too. So tribal and federal co-managers are the leads for management within their jurisdiction. We offer um, whatever consultation and assistance we can and provide whatever help we can when requested. And to be fair, it's not a one-way street. Um, these co-managers provide a lot of really important information and data and input to help guide and support statewide management. So part of the work that I'm going to be doing um, is analyzing catch data from the year 2022, and much of that catch data is being provided by these co-managers. Um, they're also, again, helping in terms of figuring out research priorities and um, other uh, um, 
guidance that can be useful for ensuring the actions we take statewide are the most productive. And I, and I do want to point out that we highlight a few groups here. Uh, so the Macaw, Macaw Indian Nation, the Lummi Nation, the Shoalwater Bay Tribe, uh, US, Fish and, uh, US Fish and Wildlife, but there are many other tribes and federal agencies that we, I couldn't fit all pictures of all activities on this one slide. Another group whose contribution has been invaluable is the Washington Sea Grant Crab Team. Um, as I already mentioned, WDFW designated them as the lead for early detection uh, program. And so what that means is in, green, in, in all invasive species management, the earlier you detect an organism when it arrives in this particular location, the greater your ability to control them and reduce their impacts is. So if you catch green crabs when they've newly arrived in an area, put a lot of effort in, try to pull them out and have a more like greater likelihood of success. Once they're established and there's a lot of them, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to have that strong of effect anymore. One other thing that Green Crab team has done is they've set up a long-term data set so they have a number of sites around the state where they've trapped the same way and the same locations at the same time of year uh, throughout the state. And so by having that long-term standardized data set, it allows us to see if there's certain trends in populations or presence or abundance um, in a way that sort of more haphazard, uh, less um, standardized trapping would. And so this is really invaluable information to have that long-term data set. Um, the crab team, sorry, the crab team's also provided a lot of um, science and uh, research expertise. I should note that I'm a recent hire to Fish and Wildlife. And so um, while I can bring a lot of research experience, um, they also have a, ton, a, a lot of experience as well to bring to the table. And so through that collaboration there, it allows for a much greater wealth of knowledge and expertise to be brought towards uh, determining what the best research goals are going forward. There are also local independent trapping partners. So these are things like local government agencies, shellfish growers, nonprofit organizations. And so they're all in, they are all involved in helping to remove green crabs. Um, and they provide actually really essential local knowledge and interest. So, you know, I haven't been able to go to every single um, location where green crabs are in Washington. And even then I don't get to spend as much time there as uh, local partners. And so they understand the area they really get a sense of where the green crabs are and how to best trap and deploy. That can only be learned through experience. And since they have that uh, local connection, they have a real strong investment in taking action in an effective way. And so they can work with us um, to do what needs to be done on the site, but also help fish and wildlife achieve statewide goals. So it's a it's a win-win situation by us working together. All right, so now a little bit of what I'm sure you all were waiting for, which is actual numbers and catch details about the last year. So the next couple of slides I'm gonna present are some basic information about green crab trapping from 2022. Uh, I wanna say that over 133 sites were trapped. This is again, not just fish and wildlife, this is fish and wildlife, uh, Sea Grant, uh, all the various tribes and co-partners. Um, and so, of those sites, less than 50% of them had green crab detections. For this map, I want to point out any blue dot represents a place where trapping occurred, but no green crabs were trapped. And a gold uh, dot represents a location where trapping occurred and green crabs were collected. It's also important to note that just because we did not detect green crabs doesn't necessarily mean they weren't there. Uh, we trap as effectively as we can and we try to trap things, but the bottom line is you can never be 100% confident that nothing is there. Um, and additionally, this does not, this particular map does not give any uh, representation of numbers or abundance. Uh, along the coast, oh, sorry. <laughs> along the coast, uh, most of our trapping, or most trapping effort that occurred was focusing on the removal of crabs. Again, on the coast, these are much more established populations in places like Willapa Bay, Grace Harbor, and Macaw Bay. Um, Whereas in the Salish Sea, it's much more about early detection and monitoring, keeping an eye out for if and when green crabs arrive. Um, although there are some locations, um, particularly in the more northern regions of the Salish Sea, where there are actively trying to remove as many green crabs as possible. That's the main focus. All right, we can go to the next slide now. 
In terms of peer numbers, can you go one more? I think it will show the regions again. There we go. So um, for the whole statewide, we had approximately 286,000 green crabs removed. I want to say approximately because although um, these numbers are as precise as I can make them, there's always some leeway and some corrections that are being made over time. Um, but this is a good, pretty good approximation of how many were removed. Um, split up by, by region, or the branch, I should say, the Salish Sea had about 81,000 green crabs removed. Primarily, this is from the North Puget Sound, and I should say primarily from Lummi Sea Pond. Lummi Sea Pond is a very unique location where um, there's been large abundances for quite a while. Um, and on the coast, our, hot, our, our greatest abundances were found in Willapa Bay and Grays Harbor and along the North Coast. Um, with 205,000 uh, green crabs removed in total. And you can go on to the next slide. Now, I want to stress, though, that getting this information is incredibly useful, but it's only the start of using that data to make um, management decisions. So the numbers I just uh, showed you are just catch. There's no other information in there. And catch alone is not particularly useful when making management decisions by itself. So to give you an example, uh, this map, these two maps here show the same three sampling locations where fish and wildlife removed green crabs from Willapa Bay in 2022. On the left-hand side of your screen is a chart showing the number of green crabs caught or removed. So you can see that most southerly site is a bright yellow. That represents that we caught around 1,000 or 1,200 crabs there. Um, the number is lower, more towards 400 in the middle, and in north, it's more towards 600. Um, however, when we take effort into account, that is to say the number of traps that we actually deployed and the number of days we went out, um, it changes pretty significantly. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see that same map, only we're measuring as catch per unit effort. Catch per unit effort is basically um, taking the number of individuals you caught and taking into account how much work you did to catch them. This is considered to be a better representation of actual abundance of crabs though there's a lot of problems with this particular um, analysis as well as it doesn't take a lot of other things into account, but it's better than just pure numbers. And you'll see here that now the northernmost site seems to show the largest abundance of green crabs as represented by catch per unit effort. With for every 100 traps we set out for a day, we caught about 480 crabs. Whereas down in the south, um, though we caught more crabs there, we deployed a lot more traps so our catch per unit effort is closer towards 380. My point is just to make that um, further analysis and assessment of the data that's been collected thus far is going to be necessary before we can use it to really make informed management decisions. And you can go on to the last one here. So in terms of what's going on next, uh, for fish and wildlife, our current step is we are bringing the field team up to full strength for the upcoming field season. So we are hiring, uh, we've been in the process of hiring new field biologists and we're bringing back seasonal technicians who had the, the winter months off. And we're bringing in um, some new uh, technicians as well to further expand our team. We want to be able to put as many people in the field to do as much work as possible. Um, I've also started um, something called the European Green Crab Research Task Force, which is an, a group that consists of researchers and experts, both within Washington and in California and Oregon and British Columbia and even nationwide, to bring our collective knowledge of green crab research together to help provide the best insight um, we can to determine what are the uh, research priorities we should really be focusing on, um, Chase mentioned earlier this idea that there are thresholds that we want to try to have. So, or actually the video we watched earlier, um, Alan Ployce mentioned this idea that there are thresholds that we want to aim for where we bring green crabs down to a sufficient number where they no longer have a strong impact, but we don't actually know what that level is. The research task force is going to help determine what those um, thresholds are and what research is necessary to determine those thresholds. I'm also going to be working with um, our co-managers and partners to analyze the 2022 green crab data to inform management decisions. We're also in the process of developing a new Salish Sea transboundary action plan. So those of you who've been involved with green crabs for um, the duration of their invasion may be aware of this document. It is a action plan that was developed to say, 
what should we do about green crabs and how can we collaboratively work with our neighbors to the north um, about this problem? You'll note by the date here on this um, image on the right that this was published in 2019 before things got more extreme. And so we're working on a new uh, revised edition to have um, be more up to date and have uh, better represent the scenario in which we're currently in. And then lastly, we're gonna continue to grow our communal and collaborative approach. We have found that uh, this is something we cannot handle alone, and that's even starting to lead into, um, you know, we need to work with other people from other states and be in communication and understanding about what's going on so that we can not only do what's best for Washington, but ensure that whatever we learn and whatever we do can also be applied in other locations so that um, as green crabs become a problem or as green crabs continue to spread, which is unfortunately likely, um, that others will have new tools in their tool belt to actually be able to deal with the problem as it goes on. All right, probably gone way too long in my chat here, but let's uh, move on uh, to our next section. Great, thank you so much, Brian. All right, I will turn it over to Jessica Osfeld. Thank you, Maria, and thank you so much, Brian, as well. I always learn something new whenever I hear you speak, so thank you. Um, my, as uh, Maria and Chase and Brian have all said, my name is Jessica Ostfeld, and I'm the European Green Crab Outreach Specialist with the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Um, and thank you all for coming today. How you can help, that's my section. Well, you're already helping by being here and learning about European green crabs. Uh, and also, I suggest that you maybe bring up some of the things you learned today uh, with your friends, with your family, with the people in your life. So. Another thing that you can do to help is to learn to ID an EGC. And what that means is learn to identify a European green crab. Uh, and the best way to identify a European green crab is by the five spines, also known as marginal teeth, on either side of their eyes. So you'll see in this diagram, there are five spines on either side of the European green crab's eyes. Uh, additionally, there are three lobes between their eyes. So this 535 pattern is unique to European green crabs among the crabs on the Pacific coast. And even just looking for those five points or those five spines on either side of their eyes is a, a good indicator that the crab you found is likely a European green crab. So remember, five spines on either side of the eyes. Next slide, please. Uh, a few other characteristics you can look out for um, are as follows. First of all, the back pair of legs can, is often, are often somewhat flattened. Uh, the carapace, meaning the main body of the crab, is usually wider than it is long, and it's no more than four inches across. Like it was mentioned earlier, European green crabs are relatively small crabs, especially when compared to our Dungeness crabs. So they're not going to be huge 10-inch monsters. They're going to be small four-inch monsters. Okay, next slide or even smaller, even one inch monsters. Uh, additionally, even though they're called European green crabs, do not use color to identify European green crabs. Because as you can see in this wonderful visual that Brian put together, European green crabs can be very variable in color. They can be orange, they can be brown, they can be whitish, they can be grayish, they can be yellowish. So color is not a good uh, indicator for whether or not the crab is a European green crab. Next slide. So what do you do if you find a European green crab or suspect that you found a European green crab? Well, what you can do is report it to us. Uh, so if you will report a suspected European green crab to us, our wonderful uh, field technicians and biologists will take a look at the photo that you submit. So you take a photo, that's how we'll know if it's a European green crab for sure. Uh, and if it is a European green crab and it's in a new location or location of concern, uh, our team or one of our partners or collaboration will respond with trapping. Uh, and as I said, it's very important that you take a photo, but it's also very important that you note the location of the crab so that we know uh, where we need to be looking. Uh, and to report your sighting, you can do this online at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, website. You can scan that QR code and it'll take you to the reporting form. You're also welcome to email our aquatic invasive species team at AIS at dsw.wa.gov or give our AIS team a call. And AIS stands for aquatic invasive species. Next slide, please. 
If you are interested in even getting further involved with your Seeing Green Crab work, uh, you could also look into joining Washington Sea Grants Crab Team. Um, according to their website, they're always looking for volunteers. Uh, and the Green Crab Team monitors for uh, traps for European traps for monitors and traps for European green crabs in new locations. Um, additionally, Washington Sea Grant, as well as the Washington State University Extension, will soon be launching a new program called Molt Search, uh, which will train volunteers on how to identify uh, European green crabs by their molt. Basically, it's the same as just what I told you um, earlier. So you look for the five signs. Um, so if you're interested in that, you can follow up on their websites, take a look. Uh, and then also, if you are an owner of Tidelands or shellfish grower, or you're coming in contact with European green crabs, you can also uh, contact us uh, to inquire about support and permits that may be available for you to uh, get involved in trapping as well. Next slide, please. And then also, we really, like I said, uh, we really encourage you to spread the word to get people talking about European green crabs. Um, so if you are involved in the organization that is interested in doing outreach around European green crabs, please feel free to reach out to me and I'd be more than happy to provide you with uh, the resources that we have, uh, including stickers, recording signs, identification signs, and we're also developing one or two other um, outreach materials as well. So please reach out to me if you're interested. Next slide, please. Also, if you are having an event, maybe you're having a uh, community barbecue or a boat show. We went to the Seattle boat show not too long ago, or I don't know, a big party. Um, you can reach out to me and invite us to come and talk about European green crabs at your event. Um, I'll bring, look, we have some really cool new European green crab models for you to look at that are real European green crabs um, and other information that we can bring uh, to your event. So just reach out to me if you're interested. And that is all. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all so much for speaking. Um, that was really great. And I know I learned a lot too. So now I am going to move into the Q&A part of the webinar. And in the Q&A box, it looks like one was answered. And we have, were the green crab part of the eelgrass die-off in the Westcott Bay on San Juan Island? Yeah, I can I can answer that one. So um, my apologies, Jim, I was going to put it in the chat for you, but I actually pressed the answer it live button. Um, so my understanding is that while there's been a die off of eelgrass there, there hasn't been a very strong green crab presence at all. So um, I think something like 10 crabs have been caught in that area. It's, it's not a very large number. Um, and there are unfortunately a number of things that can cause eelgrass die off. But my, again, my understanding is that it's in, in not in any way been attributed to green crabs, though green crabs can in large numbers have that kind of, have impacts on eelgrass beds. So thank you for asking though. Great, thank you. Well, everyone, please put your questions in the Q&A as they come up. So there was one in the chat. Chat, yes. Uh, okay, so the chat reads, we've observed European green crab grow out of control in New England. When will Washington Fish and Wildlife and Sea Grant shift from trap and study to an all out attempt to truly curb invasive green crab by opening nascent fisheries and decriminalizing possession of European green crab? For example, allowing the public to trap and destroy European green crab. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and answer that. Thanks, Alan. So really appreciate the question. It's a common question that we have. Uh, we are still at the early stages of invasion. So we are trying to make sure that we understand where these crabs are and how they're being collected and, and the best ways to, to deal with them. In the long term, there may be options for this to be uh, open to a recreational fisheries, but in the short term, it's just not, uh, it's not possible. Most of these are shore crabs. So most of this would have to be going out on intertidal, way, intertidal areas and setting traps. Intertidal areas are very uh, 
dangerous for most. And these are not your shellfish beaches that you know you walk out on the hard areas. These are often very deep muck. And we also want to be very careful what kind of gear is being used to prevent uh, bycatch mortality, mortalities of native species. So again, what typically we do, we, we you know, walk out during low tide, set traps, come back in, the tide comes in, goes back out, and then we go check those traps. So um, we, we, we want to do that so that the over, it's an overnight soak so that any bycatch isn't overly exposed to heat and other uh, issues. So there's, there's a lot going into this. And uh, as it was mentioned before, these, these, are these are not crabs that are found in your local areas that you would go out for crabbing. And so it makes it very difficult. Plus, the, you know, Willapa Bay and Grace Harbor are the only two locations right now which, you know, may have a possibility in, in the next, who knows. Ideally, we're going to keep them down at the numbers that they are now and less. Um, but if they continue to expand, we look at all options. Thanks, Alan. I, I would just add, you know, one of the reasons we really emphasize media coverage and awareness over the past year and, and why we're so excited to have Jessica on our team supporting community outreach is that we've got a lot of work to do to help support folks in identifying European green crabs and being able to tell them apart from some of our native shore crab species in particular. We've had a lot of reports to Department of Fish and Wildlife that were in fact not European green crabs. They were misidentified hairy shore crabs, kelp crabs, even graceful crabs, which are a deep water species similar to Dungeness. And I think about some of the outreach events we've done recently, like talking to hundreds of folks at the Seattle Boat Show about the five spines and the way to tell European green crabs from hairy shore crabs and not to rely on the green color. Um, we've really been emphasizing that public awareness, the identification tools, and we've got some work to do on that front. Um, to help get to a point where perhaps a, a recreational harvest could be an option because people are able to help tell these crab species, these invaders from our native shore crab species. Great, thank you both. And that reminds me that there is a poll question that I'm gonna launch now since we're talking about identification of the European green crab. So everyone, there's a poll on your screen, please vote. All right, so far I got 20, okay, going up, 28 out of 35 participants, that's pretty good. Well, everyone got it right. <laughs> Yay, yes, the five spines on each side of their eyes is the way to uh, the key feature consistently for European green crab ID. Great, thank you all. Okay, back to Q and A. Um, so Brian Turner is going has offered to answer the next question about getting involved in the European Green Crab Research Task Force. Yes. So, so Jill, thank you for the question. Um, so the task force itself is is by invitation because when we were trying to to figure out the best approach, we thought about a, diff a couple of different ways, such as um, you know public and uh, public uh, applications or um, uh, having individuals from every single member of the MAC group join in and things like that. And what, what we quickly just decided was that given the uh, number of uh, organizations involved and the real goals of the task force, that wasn't going to be achievable. Because if you to be involved in the task force, we want to have folks who have not only a wealth of experience with invasives, particularly European green crabs, but have a wealth of management experience and research experience. And so um, I found very quickly that even with that criteria in mind, my list was very long very quickly. Um, I also tried to think about geographic representation. So we have individuals from Washington and California and Oregon and British Columbia and from federal agencies involved. Um, I, I do want to stress, though, that that doesn't necessarily mean that I know absolutely every qualified person. And it's entirely possible that I don't know um, uh, someone who might be a really great fit and can contribute a lot. And so if you think there's someone who um, would be a good member, then you can email me. My email has been throughout the, the whole thing um, that you can contact. Uh, I will also say that 
you know, if people have questions just about green crab research, or if there is a, an idea that you have that you're interested in, in us considering or something along those lines, you're also welcome to email me and chat as well. Um, you don't have to be a task force member to, to get your voice heard about research concerns is what I want to say. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Brian. All right, we have another question. If the European green crab, could it invade the Great Lakes? Brian, I was really looking to you as the expert on this one, but I wanted to help tee it up with some context. You know, I, I understand that there's uh, a high degree of tolerance for lower salinity levels. So European green crabs can survive in areas that are more freshwater. At the same time, they are sensitive to colder water conditions. And we've seen, in fact, smaller numbers of European green crab in the Columbia River estuary, despite that being um, a big expansive estuary habitat that might be vulnerable to green crab, but it also tends to run colder and that potentially could be part of a deterrent to green crabs in that area. But what do you think about the options for European green crabs invading freshwater areas or potentially um, new areas in Washington state? So I think those are those are two very different questions. So purely freshwater areas, it's it's not going to happen. They are tolerant of low salinities, but freshwater will kill them. Uh, they can tolerate maybe for brief periods of time, but they are still at heart a marine species. Um, it's also important to note that tolerate does not mean likes or thrives, right? I can tolerate um, my toddler, uh, you know, throwing a tantrum, but that doesn't mean I like it. You know? So. Um, and so these conditions, while they might be able to survive them, can be very stressful for them. Given the level of presence on the East Coast, too, I would say that if it was at all likely that it could happen, it would have happened already, just given the number. But I, I will say that is just an assumption off the top of my head. I would need to do some actual like investigation. But I do not think the odds are at all likely. Um, uh, in terms of going to new places in Washington, there are definitely places in Washington where we do not find them where they can survive and they can probably do well. It's a matter of have they been introduced into those areas. It's also important to note that with invasive species, they can be introduced into an area and most of the time they won't succeed. Um, there's, a, there's a thing in invasions ecology called the TENS rule, which is in every step of an invasion process, you know, being transported from its original location, uh, getting out of wherever, however it's been transported, um, trying to find a mate, uh, reproducing, that kind of thing. We say about 10% of the individuals survive that stage. It's like, again, it's a very gross estimate. Um, so what that means is at each stage, most of them die and most of them do not succeed. And so while invasions do happen and we want to prevent them as much as possible, most of them are not successful. That is just something to, to keep in mind. Um, that being said, we know that they can live in other places in Washington, and that's why monitoring and long-term assessment and kind of uh, looking through Washington Sea Grant and other actions is so important, because when they arrive, we can try to take action as quickly as possible. That's also why we really appreciate the public letting us know. We get a lot of reports of green crabs, and I'll be honest, a lot of them are false positive, so it would be some native crab. But we still really appreciate that because it's good to know people are looking and only by getting in, in a false positive is not bad news at all. That's great news that someone is concerned and letting us know and they happen to not find a green crab. So I hope that answers the question. I got a little rambly. So, so just expounding on, on Brian's comment there, but this also can happen the inverse where invasive species, when they do find the right niche, they can expand exponentially very quickly. And that's kind of what we're finding in the, in the, in Washington state. And that's why we jumped on it as quickly as we could, both on the coastal as well as in, within the Salish Sea portions. And as was noted by Brian, we're, we're looking at different types of management regimes within the Salish Sea versus on the outer coast because of the, the number of uh, green crab larvae that there's really no bottleneck on the outer coast, but there is sort of a bottleneck coming into the Salish Sea. So a lot of what we're doing is early detection in the Salish Sea, and that helps us keep way ahead on the invasion curve so that if we find them, we can jump on them a lot quicker and, re and we're not dealing with hundreds of thousands, we're dealing with hundreds or maybe tens. And that's a lot easier to manage uh, at that point. Yeah. All right. Um, we have one more question about population 
Um, if the population number have increased in places like Willow Pit Bay, has the oyster industry noted an impact on their aquaculture farming operation? I'll go ahead and answer that. Um, so we work very closely with the shellfish aquaculture industry uh, in Willow Pit Bay. And uh, many of the growers out there are actually some of the high, high yield trappers in their uh, businesses. They have noted some predation. We don't have the data behind to do a rigorous study to say exactly how much they're impacting. All I can say is the more crabs you have, the more likely that they're going to impact the, those, um, that product. And so we want to keep the numbers low. So we could spend a lot of money trying to determine exactly how much those crabs are impacting the local, or we can spend the money actually catching crabs. It's a balance that we have to look at and uh, deal with out there. At this point, again, many growers are believe that they're seeing impacts from European green crab. And we were, you know, there's no question that they're going to be impacting them. Um, but as long as we can keep the numbers lower, then those impacts will be less. Yeah. And I'll put the link in the chat, but I did want to note that Department of Fish and Wildlife shared some information about a coastal management grant program and other support for some of our coastal partners and shellfish growers in our December European Green Crab public update. I'll put that link in there and we just sincerely appreciate all the coordination and partnership with folks out on the coast and are trying to get more resources headed that way. Mm -hmm. All right, well, it's approaching 3.15, so I want to be respectful of everyone's time. There are no more Q&As. Um, if you have any last minute questions, you can drop them in the, the Q&A. But um, I also wanted to acknowledge uh, that the Washington Department of Agriculture, as well as Oregon Department of Agriculture, have awarded a uh, one pesticide recertification credit for those who stayed the entirety of the webinar. So if you are looking for credit, I have just some simple instructions for you into the chat. Please put your first name, last name, your license number, your state, so Oregon or Washington, and then the code word. This code word, please, you have to include the code word so that we know you stayed the whole time. The code word, okay, there's two, but it's five spines. Um, and I will be entering those and submitting them to the respective departments of agriculture for credit. And aside from that, I want to thank you all for coming today and a special thanks to all the speakers. We really appreciate your time um, that you took to share with us your knowledge and your program and the outreach that's being done, everything. Uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate it and we loved hearing from you. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Thank you.